Okay, um, today we will start into the fifth and final section of the class, which is on uh, weight training and strength training. Um, this is a new section that I'm adding for the first time in this uh, summer 2023 uh, semester. We previously haven't, haven't covered this uh, section in class. So if it seems a little, a little rough and unpolished, it probably will be a little rough and unpolished because I haven't, haven't taught it before I'm doing, doing this section for the first time. Uh, this semester. Um, I added this section because I found that it was a topic that I was uh, frequently referring to for discussion um, in the other topics on, on running and sprinting and, and those things, and also a common thing that students would bring up as uh, questions or, or points of discussion on the previous topics. Um, strength training and, and uh, weightlifting is also kind of conceptually similar to uh, some of the other topics that we covered previously in that it's a sport in and of itself, like Olympic weightlifting or, or powerlifting are, are sports on their own. Um, but uh, strength training and resistance training and, and moving weights with your body is out, outside of those specific sports is a, a very common uh, form of training. And again, not necessarily every other sport, but in, in most sports, as you get to um, a certain level of competition, you'll see most athletes in, in most sports uh, engaging in some form of, uh, of weight-based uh, strength training for uh, conditioning their body for, for performance-related purposes or for injury prevention uh, purposes or both. Um, and so that's why I, I added this uh, topic here. Um, another point to keep in mind here in terms of tying this into biomechanics is biomechanics is, of course, involved in strength training and, and weightlifting, the mechanics of the body interacting with the, the, the weight to, to move the weight and, and provide a stimulus to the body for adaptations and things like that. Um, another key thing to keep in mind there in relation to that is that most of our metrics for uh, tracking and quantifying like the, the training in strength training and, and progressing the, the training load and the fitness of the athlete and conditioning of the athlete and things like that, um, are metrics that are focused on the uh, weight itself and not on the person that's moving the weight. And so an example that I'll give there is like if you're trying to progress your squat, you'll probably focus on uh, well, how, how much weight can I do for this certain number of reps or how many reps can I do with this weight or what, what was my volume today compared to previous workout or what's, what's my max weight that I can lift, lift on this squat. Um, those are all metrics that are focused on the weight that's being moved, uh, which is important, but it's also, I would say, of equal importance, but given much, much less attention in strength and conditioning on the, uh, I'll use the term quality of the movement that's used to move that weight. So kind of keep that in mind as we're going here. Um, the training load biomechanically is about the weight that's being moved, yes, but it's also about the mechanics that the person is using to move that weight. And it's the mechanics of the person that interacts with the weight that's being moved to provide uh, the stimulus to the person's body uh, for hopefully beneficial adaptations for performance uh, purposes um, in their sport. Okay, um, the paper for today, let me pull it up here, is Kampf and Aranjelovic. And this is similar to the uh, first papers in the other sections of class where I start you out with uh, a review article. This, this one's actually fairly uh, narrowly focused compared to many of the other review articles. But it's going to be kind of similar here where I'm using this article largely as motivation for some points that I want to make in the video here. And I'm not necessarily going to just go over line by line or section by section um, what they, they cover here in the article. Um, the, the first part of this article does a good job of introducing some concepts related to um, biomechanically how I kind of think about uh, weightlifting and uh, strength training. So they, they focus specifically here on three lifts, the bench press, the squat, and the deadlift, three, three common lifts that uh, typically comprise the sport of powerlifting itself but are also uh, key big movements that a lot of athletes will do and will train up uh, for the purposes of, of stimulating their muscles and their musculoskeletal system to uh, hopefully improve performance in their sport. And they talk here about uh, sticking points in uh, these three uh, weightlifting exercises and uh, what is the origin or the source or possible sources of those uh, sticking points and how that relates uh, to performance and, and uh, to some 
uh, some other topics. Um, a key point that they make here, their second key point that I want to emphasize because it relates to some topics I'll cover a little bit later in the video, is that they say contrary to what might be expected, um, currently available evidence suggests no substantial change in electromyographic activity of muscles involved in a lift near a sticking point. And so what do they mean there exactly? Um, let me go to my video here to try to demonstrate that. I'm down in my my basement at home here in my home gym. I, I, I made I bought and set up this uh, this weight rack here and this uh, this barbell during the pandemic when all the gyms were closed. Um, I, I love it. I love being able to, to work out at home. If you have the, the means for getting something like this, I strongly recommend it. I, I miss the social element of the gym a little bit, but I don't miss all the other uh, nonsense to go into a commercial gym. I, I, lo I love being able to come down here like anytime I want and do whatever I want with the, the limits of the little equipment that I do have. Um, anyway. So what do they mean here exactly by a sticking point? Um, let's see an example here um, in the bench press. So I've got my weight here, and I'm going to unrack it. And if it's way too heavy, I could get stuck here right away. right? Like if this is just way, way too much weight for me, I'll unrack it, and I could immediately fail. right? It just crashes down on me, and I, I can't even lower the weight safely, let alone complete the lift. Okay. So that would be one form. Of, uh, of failure in a bench press exercise. Um, also, I could also fail if I unrack it and then I'm able to lower it, but then I'm not able to get it up off my chest, right? Or maybe I'm not able to do it with a good form. I got to lower it and bounce it off my chest or lower it and do like a hitching movement to get it up. So that's another possible point of failure, not able to, to, able to lower it, but not able to, to push it back up off my chest. Or I could fail by I can lower it, and then I start pressing it up, but then I get stuck somewhere within that range of motion before I've locked it out there. Okay. So that's what the authors of the paper uh, mean there, broadly speaking, by sticking point. It's a uh, failure to complete the lift uh, through the normal range of motion of that lift. And then they go here uh, in the article into specifics on uh, why that might happen, possible sources of that. Uh, first, in general, that's this preliminary and, and key model concepts where they go into uh, just some general things there that generalizes to, to weight training and, and uh, weightlifting in general. Um, and then they review some evidence here on, uh, on those three, uh, three big lifts, those uh, specifics for those, those particular lifts for the bench and for the, uh, for the squat and for the deadlift. So I'm not going to cover much in the second half here where they get into the specifics of bench and squat and deadlift. We'll do some studies on that uh, later on in this section. I'm going to focus here on the uh, earlier parts. Okay. So before we get into that, let me first go over this uh, biomechanics perspective on, on weightlifting that I talked about a little earlier. So I'm going to grab a dumbbell here. And let's first talk about like what are the, the general biomechanics involved in, in weightlifting. So here's a dumbbell, and let's suppose I'm doing a, a biceps curl exercise, right? And so that would be a, a, an exercise where I've got the dumbbell typically started near, near full extension of my elbow here, and then I would produce force with my biceps to lift the weight upward against gravity like that. Okay, and get you a better, better centered view there. Okay. So biomechanically, what's going on there? Um, if you just focus on the weight, then the goal there is I need to produce a force with my hand that does work on this dumbbell to lift it upward against gravity. Okay. So if I think about, you know, back to conservation of energy back in Kines 300, what's happening there is this weight is starting at some, some lower height, and then I'm applying force to it to lift it up against gravity to a greater height, okay, and then I'm lowering it and raising it up again, and typically doing that uh, that repeatedly for most you know training-based exercises. Okay, so that's the focus um, on the mechanics of the weight being moved, um, not directly considering the biomechanics of the person or the person's joints and the person's muscles moving the weight. Okay, so if we're just focused on the weight, the goal is I've got this weight; it's at some height with a certain amount of potential energy. I'm going to do work on it with my body to add more potential energy to it to lift it up into the air. Now, where the more detailed uh, person-level biomechanics come into play 
is the means by which I do that. And uh, the interaction, and I would say the, uh, the contest or the, the tug of war between uh, torques at your joints from gravity and torques at your joints from muscles. That's how I biomechanically think about weightlifting is the weights that I'm trying to move are producing torques at my joints due to gravity that are trying to move my joints in the opposite direction from where I want them to go. I'm gonna produce forces with my muscles that produce torques at those same joints in the opposite direction of gravity to overcome gravity and in that process lift the weight. So let's, let's see an example there for, the, for that dumbbell curl again. Where here I've got my, let's get that viewed a little bit better. There we go. Okay, so here I've got my weight and then I'm going to produce force with my biceps to lift that weight. Okay, so the phenomenon there is I produce force with this muscle and that somehow does work on this weight to lift it upwards against gravity. So producing force with that muscle somehow adds potential energy to this weight to lift it up against gravity. Now, what, what exactly is, is going on there biomechanically? Um, let's first consider what happens if, suppose I'm holding this dumbbell here, and I'm, by holding it there, I'm producing a force with my biceps muscle to do that. Um, what happens if I relax the force in that muscle? Well, then my elbow extends like that. The reason that happened is because this weight, 10 pounds, is being pulled downward by gravity with a force of 10 pounds. Okay? Take that 10 pound force pointing downward and multiply it by the moment arm of that 10 pound force to the center of my elbow joint here. And that would be this distance here. Okay? Let's, uh, I'm just going to make this up to make the math easy, so let's say that's uh, 10 units of distance. Okay? So I've got 10 units of force times 10 units of distance. That gets me 10 times 10 or 100 units of torque that's going to rotate my elbow in the extensor direction. Okay? When I'm doing the dumbbell curl, I want to rotate my elbow in the opposite direction. So what I've got to do there is produce a force with my biceps muscle that gets expressed on my biceps tendon that then gets multiplied by the distance from this tendon to the center of this joint. So that, you know, that little distance there, that moment arm for my biceps tendon to my elbow joint, that force gets multiplied by that little distance to produce a torque in the flexor direction. And as long as that flexor torque from my muscle is at least as big as or a little bit bigger than the extensor torque from gravity, then the net torque at the joint will be a flexor torque and will end up flexing the joint as a net effect and, and lifting the weight upward against gravity. Okay. Now, the, you can see there in my example, the moment arm for the weight is quite long. The moment arm for the muscle force is quite short. Right? So, if I've got that 10 pound weight and it acts over a, a moment arm of some distance 10, that's 10 times 10, that's 100 units of torque due to gravity. To lift the weight, I have to produce 100 units of torque from the muscle force in the opposite direction. Right? But that muscle force only gets multiplied by a moment arm of, say, one unit of distance. I'm just making these numbers up just to make the math easy. But the point there is that the moment arm for the weight that I'm lifting is a lot longer than the moment arm for the muscle force that's resisting the gravity from that weight. Okay. So if I want to produce 100 units of torque at my, mu or at my elbow from my biceps muscle, I'll need 100 units of force in my biceps muscle because that force gets multiplied by that tiny short little moment arm, which is only a distance of one compared to this long, big long moment arm, you know, the whole length from my hand to my elbow for the, the weight that I'm lifting. Okay. So again, this is, this is just kind of a thumb rule. The, the, the specifics of this will vary a lot in reality from, from person to person or from lift to lift within a person. But generally speaking, the, the weights that you're lifting external to your body are about 10 times lighter, you know, just, just ballpark, you know, rough figure, 10 times lighter than the forces you have to produce in your muscles to, to lift those weights. Okay. So if you're 
uh, doing a bench press of 100 pounds, you're producing roughly 1,000 pounds of force with, with the muscles involved to actually uh, lift that way because they have smaller uh, moment arms or shorter moment arms uh, for the muscles inside the body than for the weights uh, outside the body due to gravity. Um, so when you talk about like uh, technique in weightlifting and the form that you use, um, it affects that relationship there, that balance of torque at your joints from gravity and the torque you're able to produce by your muscles to overcome those gravitational torques. A lot of elements of a good technique in weightlifting are uh, positioning the weight and lining the weight up in such a way that it uh, produces the smallest possible torques at the joints due to gravity so that you need the least amount of muscle force to actually uh, move that weight. And so that, that's the difference a lot of the times between, you know, everybody's probably got, you know, the friend at the gym that seems like they're a lot smaller than you, but they can just lift heavier weights for, you know, why, why is that? They seem like they shouldn't be as strong. Well, it's about uh, the, the alignment of that weight uh, with their joints is not producing as, as, as much gravitational torque at their joints as it might be for you, even though you might look like you're, you're, you're bigger and stronger, for example, for whatever reason, their, their technique is, is just set up in a way that uh, the weight is not uh, producing as much torque at their joints that they have to overcome uh, with their muscles. And so that, that's the element of technique uh, in weight training is uh, lining up the weight in a way that uh, you can minimize the uh, torques due to gravity that you have to overcome with your muscles. Now, related to that is the effect of the technique that you use in weight training on the capacity of your muscles to produce force and the capacity of that force to get transformed to muscle torque at the joints to, to work against gravity. And that's really what the first part um, of this uh, paper talks about, the first section of this paper um, talks about. I'm going to motivate that with another example here of the bench press, where one of the key things you have to do when you're setting up for a bench press exercise is you have to choose um, where do you position your hands on the bar to do the lift. Okay? And this would also apply similarly, you know, conceptually similar to set up for the, like the other two lifts in this paper, like for the squat, uh, you would choose things like the, uh, the, the width of your stance for your feet. Uh, for the deadlift, you'd have that choice and also like where you, you position the barbell, whether it's close to your shins and things like that. So all, all choices that you make in the setup of the lift that affects the, the success of that lift. So let's, let's see an example there for the bench press that hopefully illustrates the difference here between uh, focusing of the mechan on the mechanics of the weight as it moves versus focusing on the mechanics of, of the person who's moving the weight. Okay. So here, when I'm setting up for the bench press, I have to choose um, where I position my hands on the bar. Right? I could position them real narrow here, or I could position them super wide out here, or I could pick somewhere in, in the middle, anywhere in the middle there. Okay? Um, that, that width that I pick is important because it directly affects um, how much work I have to do with my body on the barbell to complete each rep there. And what do I mean by that? Well, suppose I pick a very narrow grip here, then that means I have to do a lot of work on this barbell to lift it because I have to lower it and raise it over basically the furthest possible vertical distance there. Compared to Suppose I pick a really wide grip here, and this is about as wide as I can get while still being able to actually re-rack the weight. Notice there how much lower that barbell is starting than when I had the real narrow grip there. Okay. This is light enough, I can probably just show you both of them here. But here's the height when I have uh, the very wide grip versus here's the height with a very narrow grip. Okay, so this barbell is substantially higher up in the air with the narrow grip. So if I use the wide grip, then I don't have to do as much work on that barbell to lift it. Okay. So there, by just focusing on that weight, you might think that, oh, if I want to, you know, bench press the heaviest possible weight, which, you know, the, the more weight you do, that's generally considered a, a more intense lift, which, it, which at least for some uh, some desired adaptations for some athletes is, you know, an important metric to, you know, to be increasing the intensity to induce, you know, further and further 
uh, muscle level adaptations, you might think to, that to pursue that, the best thing to do would be to grip the barbell as wide as possible. Right? But anybody who's done a lot of bench pressing will tell you, well, no, in, in practice, that's not really what you do. You don't want the narrowest grip. You don't want the widest possible grip. Typically somewhere in the middle, like a medium length grip, is the best thing to do uh, for, for being able to bench press the most weight or being able to, to do the, the largest number of reps with, with a certain weight. And why is that exactly? Because we, we just saw that like, oh, if I want to lift the weight, I'm, you know, if I grip it wider, then I don't have to lift it as far. So that should be easier, right? Um, there I'm focusing just on the weight. I'm not focusing on the mechanics of the person lifting the weight. And when I focus then on the mechanics of the person lifting the weight, positioning my hands in different places on the bar will affect the uh, mechanics of my muscles and how much force they're able to produce at certain parts throughout the lift and will also affect the uh, kinematics between my muscles and my joints and how much of my muscle force or, or how much torque I'm able to get at my joints from the muscle forces that I'm producing. So that's really what the first few pages about this paper are about. Um, they talk about uh, several different concepts that can serve as uh, sticking points in general for uh, weight training. Um, the first one they cover here relates to the uh, cross-sectional area of the muscle, uh, which is basically like how, how thick and wide a certain muscle is. And uh, that cross-sectional area generally scales with the uh, maximum force a muscle is able to produce. So generally, the bigger and stronger a muscle is, all other things being equal, the more force it's, it's going to be able uh, to produce. Um, there's two different types of areas that it talks about here. There's the uh, anatomical cross-sectional area and the physiological cross-sectional area. Um, the distinction there is you can think of physiological cross-sectional area as the uh, kind of being a, a, an assessment of how many fibers or what, what's the size or mass of muscle fibers that are in a muscle. And then you can think of anatomical cross-sectional area as the uh, fraction of that size that's able to express force in the direction of the tendon, which is the force that's actually going to move the joint and lift the weight against gravity. Okay. So in terms of like which one, physiological cross-section or anatomical cross-section, which one's more relevant for strength, broadly speaking, kind of depends on the question, right? If you're concerned about producing a lot of force with your muscle fibers, physiological cross-section is more relevant for that. If it's more about producing force to, uh, to lift weights and get, you know, large forces in the tendon to actually move the joints and move the weight against gravity, then it's more about the uh, anatomical cross-sectional area. So for our purposes, anatomical cross-sectional area in this section of class is, is the more important variable here. Um, this is the quantity that they kind of highlight is not really limiting you in terms of at least the available evidence for reaching like a sticking point. Obviously, you can reach a sticking point if you don't have enough like sheer muscular strength to lift the weight that you're working with. Um, but suppose you do have that strength, uh, are you able to like fully recruit and activate the, that mass of muscle to an extent that you can produce the force needed to lift the weight? Um, that's that key point that they make under their, their second key point on the front page, that it, it doesn't appear that uh, sticking points, at least in these three lifts, occur often from like insufficient muscle activation or having sufficient strength to perform the lift but not being able to, to realize that strength, to recruit the muscle and send you know, the signal from the nervous system to the muscle to actually get it to, to produce that force. Um, at least in most situations, and mo most of these studies were probably on fairly well-trained athletes, uh, that doesn't appear to be a, a limiting factor in, in performance of a lift like this. Um, so we rule that one out. And what else are the limiting factors that could um, affect the ability of somebody to actually complete um, a, a lift with, with a certain technique? Um, they talk about several of them, and I will again demonstrate here uh, with my dumbbell, where suppose I'm doing a dumbbell curl here, and as I'm doing that curl, the kind of sense of effort that I have of that movement is not constant throughout that range of motion, right? There's parts of the lift that feel easy, 
um, compared to other parts of the lift that feel hard. And this is something that might vary from person to person. But for me, the first part of the lift, like getting it started, that's easy. I could sit here and do this all day. The hard part is when I get near the top there. Like here it's easy and oh, nope, now it's getting more difficult, right? So my, my sense of effort is, is not the same um, throughout that entire range of motion of the lift. If I was going to fail, I probably wouldn't fail down here at the bottom. I'd fail somewhere up here near the top where, I, where I'm unable to, to complete the lift. And, and why is that exactly? What's, what's going on there mechanically? Um, they bring up several things that are happening there that can potentially be sources of sticking points at that muscle level there. Um, the two key ones that they mention here are the force length relationship and the force velocity relationship. And these are things that I yammer on about in, in Kinesis 300 and in this class too, so you're probably at least superficially familiar with these things. Um, key thing here for force length relationship, and this isn't necessarily true of like all muscles in all humans. Um, the, the quadriceps are, are the, the prom, prominent exception in a lot of people where it doesn't necessarily behave like this. But for most of the other like large muscle groups that we train in, in weightlifting movements for most sports or most people in most sports, um, generally speaking, when a muscle is stretched to a longer length, it can produce more force than when it's shortened to shorter lengths. So the example there would be for my, you know, for my biceps here, when I'm, when my elbow is fully extended there, that's when my biceps is stretched to longest length and that's when it can produce the most force. As I flex the elbow there, that muscle contracts and gets shorter and shorter with more and more elbow flexion there. And from its force length relationship, it can generally produce less force as it shortens and contracts there. Okay. Um, that's what they're showing here in uh, this figure, figure A here, where this is, this is kind of a busy figure. There's, there's a few things going on here. Um, T, the, the thick black line there labeled T, you can think of that as like the, the total force in the muscle that gets expressed on the tendon. Um, some of it's from like voluntary activation of the muscle fibers. Um, some of it's from like pure like elastic stretch of, of the materials involved there. But regardless of the source of them, you can think of that as, as the total force um, in the muscle that gets expressed um, along the, the tendon. And you can see there as you're at long lengths, you can produce uh, the most force. And then as you shorten to shorter and shorter lengths, you can produce gradually uh, less and less force in a kind of a complex nonlinear fashion, but still overall, you know, less force as we shorten the muscle there to shorter and shorter lengths. Okay. So that can be one factor on why you, uh, you might get stuck during a weightlifting exercise, is your muscle has been shortened to a length or just more generally speaking has, has reached a length where it can't produce enough force to overcome the torque uh, due to gravity that that weight is producing at that joint. Okay. Uh, another factor here that can cause you to get stuck is, oh, wrong button, sorry is this force velocity relationship. And that's this relationship here that says here, this dot, that's how much isometric force I can produce when my muscle's fully activated. Um, so the, the dumbbell curl example there would be, you know, that would be the heaviest possible weight that I could just hold here against gravity, right? I can't lift it. Um, it's not so heavy that gravity is winning out. It's just the heaviest possible weight that I can hold here with an isometric muscle contraction. Um, as I then uh, contract the muscle faster and faster, I can produce gradually less and less force. And as I eccentrically activate the muscle or activate it under a stretching load faster and faster, I can produce more and more force up to some uh, particular point. Um, the example that I like to give here is for bench press. If I'm, if I'm just doing the bar, which is pretty light for most people, I can do that real fast right? Because I don't need a lot of force. So I can shorten my, I can contract my, my chest muscles and my shoulder muscles and my triceps muscles. I can contract them quickly to, to produce that force and lift that weight, right? So in that case, I'd be, you know, somewhere down here on my, on my force velocity curve. As I add more and more weight to the barbell, then I need more and more force and I can contract those muscles slower and slower, right? Eventually, 
I add so much weight that I get to this isometric point here, and there I wouldn't be able to move the weight. I'd just be able to hold it there, you know, isometrically. If you know you then have somebody stack even more weight onto it, then gravity would win out, and then I'd be you know eccentrically stretching those muscles. I'd be producing more force, but I'm not able to to overcome uh, gravity there, and that's what would be happening here on on this eccentric side. Okay. So you could fail in the sense that you're lifting a weight, but the force that you need to keep proceeding with the lift is so high that it's reached or exceeded your maximum isometric force. And I'm no longer able to produce a, a non-zero force while still, while still contracting the muscle. I'm no longer able to produce the force uh, that I need while actually shortening the muscle at, at a non-zero velocity. Okay, so those are two um, muscle level factors here that, uh, that can involve uh, a sticking point, so that can cause you to uh, fail the lift. Now, it would be possible to still complete the lift, right? Uh, by uh, using crappy form or using sloppy form, right? Like I could deviate from uh, whatever form I was using to get some, some extra source of, of doing work on that weight to lift it up. You know, like for example here, if I'm doing my, my dumbbell curl and I fail there, oh, I'm stuck, I'm stuck. Um, I could come over and give it a push with my other hand and keep going there, right? Or I could, you know, jerk it up uh, with the, the rest of my body to, to get that weight lifted up in the air. Okay, so that would be an example of um, what's typically considered uh, bad form or poor form or suboptimal form uh, for strength training purposes. I'm, I'm lifting the weight, but I'm doing it by uh, adding in sources of performing work on the weight um, other than the, the target muscle groups that that, uh, that that exercise is supposed to be providing a stimulus to. Okay, last topic that they cover here and the one that is most important for kind of understanding uh, kind of my perspective here on uh, the biomechanics of weightlifting is this notion of torque. Um, this is an important one because this is the transformation from the muscle level, you know, the tissue level perspective to the joint level perspective. Um, if you took Kines 300 uh, with me as the instructor, at least if you took it recently, which I'm guessing most of you did, um, I talk there, I cover biomechanics at a a range of smaller and smaller physical scales from the whole body uh, to the limb level to the joint level to the tissue level to the cellular uh, slash molecular level and so here we're talking about looking at the muscle level and the forces the muscle produces and how those translate to the joint level okay because the joint level is where kind of the balance that I talked about earlier takes place the balance between torques due to gravity at a joint versus torques due to muscles at a joint and muscles uh, winning out there in kind of a net sense to rotate the joint and move the weight uh, upward against gravity. Okay? So we achieve uh, linear motion of the weight that we're trying to lift through angular motion of the joints involved spanned by the muscles that are, that are powering that lift. Okay? Um, this topic here in the paper on torque relates to taking that muscle force and transforming it or translating it to a torque produced at a joint that rotates that joint to overcome gravity. And what is that transformation? Um, it's mathematically simple. It's the force in the tendon times R, which is the moment arm for that tendon to the center of the joint that you're rotating things about. Okay? And so the product of those two things, muscle force or tendon force times tendon moment arm to the joint gives you the torque from that muscle at that joint. So if you want a visual example here, I'm lifting this, this dumbbell and I'm moving it upwards against gravity. And if you could snap your fingers and freeze it right there, there's a force in my tendon right now. Take that tendon force times that little distance that I'm tracing out there with my index finger. That distance is the distance from the tendon to the center of the joint, the elbow, that that tendon spans. Okay, take that force times that distance, and that's the torque that that muscle is producing about that joint. And it's that torque, the product of that muscle force times that muscle moment arm, that needs to be uh, at least as big as the gravitational torque that that weight is producing in the opposite direction at that joint to overcome gravity and lift the weight upwards against gravity and 
uh, from kind of a net energetics perspective, add potential energy to that weight to, to lift it up. Now, the, the complicating factor here, and they go over some pretty, uh, some pretty detailed math here in terms of like there's cosines and angles and, and stuff. Um, what they're getting at there is the direction of this muscle force, of this tendon force, will change throughout the range of motion of a lift. And the uh, kind of the geometry of the moment arm itself will change throughout the range of motion of a lift. Okay? Um, if you want just kind of a, a concise summary there, um, kind of the take home message is that this distance R, the moment arm from the tendon to the center of the joint is not a, a constant invariable distance. It's going to vary throughout the lift that you're doing based on a variety of factors. Um, the, the distance from the tendon to the center of the joint is in general a function of the angle of the joint. Um, that, that relationship is, is fairly complex and variable. It's not as simple as like, uh, you know, the, the more extended the joint is, the shorter the moment arm and the more flexed, the longer and things like that. It's, it's, some muscles are like that, some joints, some muscles are like that. Some are some are fairly linear relationships. Some are complex and nonlinear. But just generally speaking, the moment arm for a muscle is a function of the the current angle of the joint it spans. Um, it can be a function of the velocity of the joint. It can be a function of the uh, amount of stretch in the tendon or the amount of tension in the tendon. Um, all of those things can affect the the actual instantaneous value of R here. The actual um, instantaneous length of the moment arm for a tendon. And that's important because that's directly affecting how much torque you get at a joint from a particular muscle force. Okay. So a, a failure in a lift or a, a sticking point in a lift, a failure to complete a lift throughout the desired range of motion um, could happen not necessarily because the muscle can't produce enough force, but because the moment arm is, is too short. You're not able to get enough torque at the joint from that muscle force to, to overcome the, the torque due to gravity about, of, of the weight in, in the opposite direction. Um, they cover some other things here, but those are, those are the three uh, big ones that I wanted to go over. The muscle level limitations in terms of force length and force velocity, and the joint level limitations in terms of the moment arm uh, limiting how much torque you might get out of, out of a given um, muscle force. Okay. So all things that we need to consider and all things that you're kind of uh, implicitly considering when you, for example, like uh, select a moderate uh, distance for your hands or a moderate position for your hands in the barbell when you're doing, uh, for example, a bench press exercise. If you pick the widest possible position, that would minimize the amount of work you have to add or perform on the barbell to add potential energy to it to lift it. But it's not considering things like well, where does that put, you know, my chest muscles and my shoulder muscles and my elbow muscles? Where does it put them on their force length and force velocity curves? Uh, what effect does that have on the uh, moment arms for my muscles during that lift? Generally speaking, as you widen your hands there, that's going to be compromising those things and compromising them to such an extent that it eventually overcomes the benefit of not having to do as much work um, on the barbell to lift it. So those, those more detailed mechanics, those more detailed biomechanics, of the person and of the muscles and joints of the person doing the lift are why it's best to have a, mo typically best at least, to have a, a moderate hand position there on the barbell uh, to lift the, the heaviest weight or to lift the uh, a certain weight for, them for the most number of reps or any other particular goal. Okay, um, I, I bring up all those things to kind of highlight an important point here to keep in mind, uh, tying it back into to what I first talked about in this, uh, in this video on, uh, on training metrics in that those metrics are usually focused on the, uh, the weight itself, you know, the weight that's being lifted, uh, the, the actual or the estimated maximum weight that you can lift, uh, the, the, the volume that, you, that you're doing for, for your training. Um, I'm, I'm greatly oversimplifying a, a large amount of research here in, in strength and conditioning for, for weight training, but there's generally uh, two metrics in terms of a weight training program that are important for uh, stimulus to the body and to the muscles for, for inducing, uh, hopefully, performance improving adaptations to those muscles. That's the uh, intensity of the training, which is typically quantified by, by the amount of weight being lifted and progressing that amount of weight being lifted, and the uh, volume of the training. Vol volume in, in weight training circles is uh, the weight that you're lifting times the reps times the sets. 
right? So if you do 100 pounds for uh, 10 reps times three sets, uh, that's 3,000 units of volume, right? 10, or sorry, 100 pounds times 10 reps is 1,000 times three sets is 3,000, right? So then the next time you do that workout, you'd want to do 3,000, you know, 3,100, and then 30, you know, 3,300, 3,500, 4, you know, you'd want to be progressing that volume. Um, similarly to progressing the intensity, if you're doing like uh, five rep sets, you'd want to be then doing five rep sets with uh, an extra five pounds on the bar and then 10 pounds and then 20, you know, progressing the intensity of the movement. Um, with those metrics that are uh, focused on the weight, it can be easy there to, to fall in love with, with progressing those metrics, right? And this is something I find myself guilty of. You may not know it from looking at me, but I, I like to do strength training and, and weightlifting. It's been my main form of exercise for the last few years at least. Um, and I, I'll be down here like in my little home gym with, with my laptop up, pulled up to the spreadsheet where I track like, you know, I did this, many, you know, this weight for this many reps and sets on this date. And like, I, I enjoy that. Like that's something I find uh, uh, fun and, and, and enjoyable about, about the hobby and about the exercise. I, I like tracking the numbers and, and looking at my progress and seeing the progress. Um, but when you're doing that, it can be easy to fall in love with progressing the weight related numbers and doing that in a way that compromises uh, the quality of the reps that you're doing, right? Let me, let me give an example here of what I mean by that to, to close things out here. So let's suppose I'm doing my bench press here and I come in and I do a workout and in that first workout, I do this weight for three reps, right? One, two, three, okay? So that's my baseline. And then the next time that I come in, um, I might want to progress that volume up to doing uh, four reps. So ideally, I progress that in a way that maintains the quality of those reps. I still do the three quality reps that I just did, and then I add to that a fourth quality rep. Okay. So that would look something like this. I do one, two, three, four. So the fourth rep that I added there, that, that was a, a quality rep. I didn't have to compromise my, my form or my, my biomechanics, my technique to, to do that rep. Um, so that would be good progress. Bad progress would be something like, I do the three, one, two, three, but then on the fourth one, I've gotta bounce it off my chest like that. Or on the fourth one, I get stuck, and then I've gotta hitch it up like that. And I've gotta use my, my hips or my, my chest or my weight to get the weight up like that. So in those cases, I've, I've compromised the quality of the reps that I'm doing because I reached a sticking point and in order to progress, I had to do something that did work on the barbell outside of using the, the, the work and the effort and the forces of, of the muscles that are supposed to be involved in completing that lift. So if I then, you know, go down to my spreadsheet, I'm like, oh, I did, you know, X weight where for, for four reps that time, I progressed my volume last time I only did three. Yeah, that's technically true. I completed it. I got the weight up, right? But I did it in a way that compromised the quality of my reps. Okay. So I'm, I'm doing more volume. I progressed my volume metric based on the weight, but I probably didn't progress and maybe even regressed on the stimulus to my muscles that I'm trying to adapt. Uh, for, for getting the beneficial performance related adaptations from that training. Okay? So those are just important things to, to keep in mind when you're doing your own training or when you're training other people is yes, it's important to progress the, uh, the weight that's being lifted and the volume of that weight and all these things. Um, but it's also important to keep in mind the, the mechanics of the person moving the weight and maintaining the, the quality of the reps that you're doing so that you're progressing it in a way that's, that's maintaining the, the good stimulus on those muscles that you're, that you're supposed to be targeting uh, with, with those particular lifts. Okay, that is it for today. And we will delve into some more uh, specific uh, strength-related biomechanics next time.